With the successful static fire of booster number 3 and the near completion of the orbital launch tower, all eyes are on Starship's orbital test flight that's supposed to happen sometime this year. But just for a moment, I want to look beyond the hype that's surrounding the first flight test of a full stack of Starship and Super Heavy, and I want to look at what kind of payloads we can expect the first couple flights of Starship to carry once they start transitioning from testing to a commercial and operational Starship which I think is going to be a vehicle like we haven't seen before. And speaking of vehicles we haven't seen yet, we still haven't seen the exact design that the first orbital starships will have, and it's likely the first few especially won't have any payloads, since they're not even going to be making a full orbit, as they'll either do a deorbit burn or deorbit naturally through aerodynamic forces somewhere over the Pacific. But when operational starships do come, they'll obviously be carrying Starlink satellites, as we've seen on the Falcon 9, where Starlink payloads are often the record-breaking ones when it comes to reusability, SpaceX is more than willing to use its Starlink payloads as envelope-pushing exercises, which I think Starship definitely qualifies for. And with Gwen Shotwell saying that 400 Starlink satellites can fit into a Starship, it's just a no-brainer, especially when you see their competitors, OneWeb and Kuiper, being forced to launch their rockets on expendable vehicles like the Atlas V and Soyuz. Alongside the Starlink missions, we could even see tests of Starship's refueling hardware. It's a key part of the mission architecture not only to Mars, but also to the Moon. Because don't forget, SpaceX is now the sole source Artemis winner, pending any litigation, of course. And that means that SpaceX has a deadline. They need to get refueling working by 2024, or let's be real, more like 2025, in order to get astronauts to the Moon on their HLS proposal, the Moonship. But they also need to send another uncrewed demonstrator mission to the moon sometime around 2023, they said. This means they're going to need to begin testing on refueling right away. Lucky for SpaceX, Uncle Sam has already funded the development of Rendezvous and Docking in Space, thanks to the Commercial Crew Program and the Dragon 2 vehicle. Therefore, I don't actually expect the docking to be the hard part when it comes to refueling, but the actual transfer of propellants. To this end, NASA's awarded a bunch of tipping point contracts, which include SpaceX's Starship, in order to gain experience on the issue of transferring propellants in space. But it's not like this is an impossible task. The ISS is refueled constantly to reboost its orbit, and the issue of settling propellants could be easily solved with hot gas thrusters, which we've already seen on Starship, and the header tanks, which are designed literally for low-G environments. Who knows, if we see SpaceX get down orbital refueling fast enough, we might even see them make it to the 2022 Mars launch window, which would be quite a sight to see. But I'm definitely not holding my breath. But I think the question everyone's really asking is how SpaceX and Starship will fare in the commercial market. Because although it will likely be offering a radical new capacity, the satellite industry, like many others, is a slow one, especially when you've got birds that can cost up to $100 million on the line they're hesitant to accept any new launch vehicle, especially one built in a field that's larger than the Saturn V. But I do think the launch market will accept Starship at some point, and at that point, it's going to be the price of Starship that's going to be the main determining factor, because at the end of the day, money speaks. And there are two factors that are going to determine the initial success of Starship on the commercial market. Number one, the cost of Starship. And number two, the ability of the space economy to shift to a paradigm where mass isn't everything and off-the-shelf components can be used more readily since you don't have to fit to absurd mass margins that just simply lend themselves to $50,000 screws. Let's tackle the first and arguably easier question first. You can split Starship into roughly three categories of costs. There's the cost for development, the cost for actually building a Starship, and then the cost to maintain and continue reflying that starship. Elon Musk has said in an interview with CNN that development costs for Starship are roughly two to three billion dollars. Compare that to the 9.1 billion dollars for the space launch system or one billion dollars for the tiny Virgin Orbit Launcher 1. So theoretically SpaceX would want to spread out or amortize that cost over its commercial Starship launches. But it's important to note that that won't affect any of the colonization or Starlink launches because SpaceX wouldn't have to pay for its own R&D. And speaking of R&D, I actually stumbled across something really interesting. It's a NAFCOM of SpaceX's development of the Falcon 1 and Falcon 9. NAFCOM stands for NASA and Air Force Cost Model, 
and this specific one was to estimate the cost of developing the Falcon 9 using two different approaches, a traditional NASA environment and culture, aka cost plus contracts, and a more commercial development culture used by SpaceX. And the results were shocking. The report estimated that it would cost $3.9 billion to develop the Falcon 9 using a NASA management style, while it would only cost roughly $1.9 billion when using a SpaceX model. And this, just to be clear, was done in 2011. So this was roughly around the time that SLS was being developed, and they obviously learned none of the lessons. And if that wasn't enough, after a visit to SpaceX to get a closer look at their management policy and construction techniques, they actually revised their $1.6 billion estimate downwards to $443 million, which actually wasn't too far from the $400 million it actually took to develop the Falcon version 1.0. SpaceX knows what they're doing when they develop rockets, and I expect Elon's numbers to be roughly correct. Another source of price savings is the material Starship is going to be made out of. It's going to be made out of stainless steel as opposed to normal aerospace grade aluminum lithium. With the aluminum lithium costing roughly $225 a kilogram and the stainless steel costing roughly 4 So that accounts roughly for the tanks of the Starship. But what about its engines? Now the Raptor has had an evolving price point over the years, with it starting out at roughly $2 million per engine. Elon Musk recently saying it was tracking under 1 million, and now with Elon even announcing that they're going to standardize most of the Raptor variants instead of splitting the production line into Raptor Boost and Raptor Gimbal, means that the cost of the Raptor is likely going to drop even further, even seeing SpaceX get close to that quarter of a million dollar mark for the Raptor, and Raptor is going to be super important to getting Super Heavy and Starship's cost down, because there's going to be 33 engines on Super Heavy, and 6 to 9 Raptors on the Starship means that Raptors are going to be a huge part of the Starship architecture, and at a cost of a million apiece, that could easily put you over $39 million. But if I had to guess, the first couple Starships will have engines that cost around $500 to $750,000, putting the engines at roughly $20 to $30 million for the whole vehicle. And that's not bad, considering one RS-25 engine is going to cost the SLS about $146 million. And now that's price and not cost since Aerojet Rocketdyne is an independent contractor. But still, you gotta love those cost plus contracts. A noticeable omission I've made in the cost of a per unit starship is labor. And that's because I don't think I could get a real figure on labor without tons of speculation that I'm just really not comfortable doing. I think it's kind of a folly to come out with a real price tag for starship yet when the design hasn't even solidified. We don't know if it's going to be landing with its legs or with a tower. We don't know how many engines are going to be on the Starship. It's a fluid design with fluid price tags. But I just want to give you guys a sense of its relative price in the market, which I think is going to be pretty low. Starship could be an effective vehicle, totally expendable. I mean, it would probably have a lower price to kilogram than things like the Delta IV Heavy or definitely the SLS. When you see reuse come into the equation, it's going to be all that more revolutionary. And that's what I want to get into now. Starship is going to be a much easier vehicle to reuse. It's a Methalox cycle unlike the Carolox cycle of the Falcon 9, which means that it's going to have a much easier time being refurbished or just plain reused. Unlike kerosene, methane just simply doesn't have the time to form long chains of carbon molecules in the extremely hot environments of an engine. Therefore, we won't see the sooting and coking that are such a problem with the Falcon 9. You have to remember, Starship was designed for rapid reuse. The Falcon 9 was just jury-rigged along its way, and it's doing just fine. So I don't suspect SpaceX will have too many troubles reusing Starship. And with measures like catching the booster and landing the Starship right next to the landing pad, mean even quicker turnaround times, and in this business, time is money. Apart from labor, the other main part when reusing a Starship no refurbishment or anything involved, is going to be fuel. And that fuel, according to Elon Musk, is going to cost roughly $500,000. And you can see in that tweet he cites a cost of around $1.5 million. But there's a couple key emissions in that figure. There's no labor, there's no cost of engines, there's no cost of the materials that go into Starship. It's just simply the cost to refly the Starship. He's thinking like that because he's thinking of a starship that can fly up to a thousand times, three times a day. And in that case, you don't even have to worry about the initial cost of the vehicle. 
because it's going to be spread out over so many flights, amortized. But, when you're talking about the early days of Starship, we've only just seen a Falcon 9 hit 10 reflights. So I definitely think the cost is going to be significantly above that, especially when you're looking at the early days of Starship. So, to be conservative, let's assume a Raptor costs around $750,000, and multiply that by the number of Raptors, 39. You get $29,250,000. Add around a million dollars of materials cost for your stainless steel, and you're at around $30 million. Remember, there's no labor in this cost, and that's a huge amount of the actual cost of a rocket. This number also doesn't figure the roughly $2-3 to $3 billion of R&D that have been put into the Starship program. But if Starship can be rapidly reusable as Elon claims, then you would see the price of Starship go down from the likely hundreds of millions it would probably sell as an expendable rocket on the commercial market to something on the order of tens of millions, and I'm talking about price, not cost. One Starship is fully operational on the commercial market, I wouldn't be surprised if its price was somewhere around the Falcon 9s, at around $62 million. But when, or if they start nailing reuse, hopefully it's a when, you could definitely start seeing that price walk down, especially because SpaceX actually wants to encourage people to build more satellites. SpaceX is a transportation company, and you need something to transport. And while I'm sure SpaceX would be happy launching Starlink satellites ad infinitum until they shift to Mars colonization, they're going to need some things to keep the lights on. And so encouraging a sluggish satellite industry to continue launching more satellites at cheaper cost would be a great way to sustain Starship's development, and hopefully Mars as well. And Mars, after all, is the main goal of Starship development. And I expect flights to begin, hopefully in 2024, and Elon's floated the idea of proving in-situ resource utilization by using an entire Starship, the upper stage, not the whole thing, as the container for an ISRU rig that just sits there in the payload bay and creates propellant for the ride home. Along with ISRU, you're going to need mining equipment, habitats, food before you can get your farm on Mars working, of course. The communication satellites you're going to need for increased bandwidth. And all the other things a colony on Mars is going to need, like solar panels or a nuclear reactor. It's hard to say exactly what shape the Mars colonization program is going to look like, but it's needless to say it's going to require a lot of launches, especially refueling launches. So to begin in earnest, the Starship program is going to need a near-perfect recovery rate, which is also going to be needed if you ever want to get crew on there, but that's a whole nother story. Let's just say if you're going to be putting people through a belly flop landing, you better make sure you know what you're doing. And luckily, the high cadence of Starship launches will hopefully allow SpaceX to prove that to a pretty reasonable extent. Another sector where heavy lift launch capabilities like SpaceX's Starship are sorely needed is the science department. It could allow for the launches of space telescopes like James Webb without the need for such complex unraveling devices for their mirrors, thanks to the fact it's got an 8 meter internal diameter on its fairing, which is great news. There's also those renders of it holding Louvoir B inside of it for when 8 meters or 9 meters isn't enough. Some crazy people went out and built a 15 meter wide telescope that can make maps of planets orbiting other stars. It's a crazy proposal that's going to cost a ton of money, I'm sure, but what's important to us today is that it can be launched on Starship. Another capability which Starship has is the ability to launch interplanetary probes. If it's refueled in a highly elliptical orbit, and then does one huge burn at periapsis, it can get tons of mass to tons of different locations in the outer and inner solar system. I'd love to see probes designed and built for Starship, where mass is hardly an issue and you don't have to do 30 gravity assists just to get to Jupiter. I'm sure I haven't even scratched the surface with Starship though, and it's going to be an incredible vehicle when it starts flying, both commercially and in its goal of Mars colonization and opening up space for everyone. Which has been a real hot topic with the flight of both Bezos and Branson to space in the past couple weeks. And I think Starship is going to be the first vehicle that's going to offer us at least a glimmer of that democratization of space that we've been chasing after for 60 years. And I really think not since the shuttle in the 70s and 80s have we really seen such excitement about the design of a new vehicle. And unlike a lot of other programs, it only gets better when you look at the actual numbers behind the program. 
All that's left is to actually build and launch the damn thing, and I trust no one more than the men and women at SpaceX to actually do that. I wish them the best of luck on the orbital flight test of Starship, and I thank you all for watching the video. I'm Cosplus Content, signing off.